Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. As we mark this one year milestone of COVID-19, there is reason for hope. We now have three vaccines in preventing and fighting this disease. And here in Minnesota, more than one million people have already been vaccinated. I know as soon as it's available to me, I will make sure that I'll get whatever is available to me to take. So, and now we go to the front lines on our fight against COVID. And we're, we begin with the Minnesota National Guard Task Force COVID Officer in Charge, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Wolf. So glad to have you with uh, us. Thank you for this having me. It's really an honor to have you with us. And so it's a privilege for me to be here and represent the Minnesota National Guard. Thank you. And I know that the Minnesota National Guard has been very active fighting COVID here. And before you talk a little bit about what you've been doing, maybe you can tell us what kind of an impact has COVID-19 had on the Minnesota National Guard with your um, soldiers and airmen? Right. You know, when you ask that question, I think kind of two sort of things right off the bat. And first of all, you know, I think of the impact that we've had with our own infection rate, and it's really sort of mirrored um, that that you see also in the civilian world. Um, but more specifically, I think to what you're kind of getting at is how has it impacted us? And I think back about a year ago when the pandemic started last spring, you know, our service members were out, they were college students, they were manufacturing uh, white collar, blue collar workers. Some of them were furloughed, some were essential healthcare workers. And in early May, we were asked to support state efforts to address the, the pandemic that we're all going through. And, and at one point we had over 600 service members completing this support and completing this mission. And um, we've been doing it since then. So tell us a little bit about some of the things that you've been doing. I know that you've been focusing on three areas in particular starting last year, and um, one of them is with the, um, the nasal swab um, community right. test sites. What are those? What's involved with that? Where have you been doing them? Where are you in that whole process? Sure, sure. So we started nasal testing, and in my mind that was really phase one of, of all the support that we offered to the state and to the Department of Health in particular. And we started back in May, and we... Um, we're doing nasal pharyngeal swabs initially. So those were the long, deep sort of right. Q-tip uh, that nobody was really comfortable with. Um, Midsummer, we switched to the anterior nasal swab. And actually since then, we've transitioned to more of the saliva testing. And you've been doing those all over the state at lo certain locations at armories? And we things? have, we've kind of done a combination. So okay. we've had some community sites in particular on weekends uh, initially. I've seen your, um letting people know that that's going on. Right, so. so when we started last summer, it was primarily community sites throughout the state uh, where we've, we've offered it up free to anybody in the community. Uh, during the weekdays, we really focused on long-term care facilities and nursing homes throughout the state. So we were traveling, sometimes doing up to uh, testing at four facilities in a day. Um, and now more recently, we've sort of backed away from that and, and really focused on the community sites instead of the long-term care testing. So currently, right now, you are doing those across the state as well? We are. The, We've got multiple sites throughout the state. And, and it's both testing that you're doing or we are doing, most of the saliva? Then? We are doing just the saliva testing now, and that's really in partnership with the Department of Health. And, uh, and the main reason it's, it's easier to, to do those? Is that Much why? Much more user-friendly. <laughs> user-friendly. I guess for that's the, the word I was looking for. For the yeah. viewers who really, um, who've gone to sites and been tested multiple times, if you've had the deep nasal pharyngeal, uh, versus the anterior nasal versus the saliva test. I don't know of anybody who would say, I'll take one of the other ones, I'll just do the saliva test. It's much more user friendly. And um, it's got to be satisfying for you guys to play that role in the state and helping to fight this COVID-19 here. It really is. And, and as we've gone through what I call the phases where we've done, you know, the COVID testing and then support in long-term care facilities and now into the vaccination effort, it's been rewarding to sort of see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel and, and hopefully some return to normalcy. Yeah, I'm really starting to see that as well. You know, and a little bit more about the long-term care facilities, you were helping out supporting those and tell us a little about what you were doing. We were, you know, I think back, uh, I believe it was early October, um, we were asked to support um, long-term care facilities who were in sort of a crisis staffing mode. Um, I think back uh, a few years ago, I, and I heard a, a quote, a phrase, um, talking about the Minnesota touch. And, and I think about that often over the past few weeks and months and how it sort of encapsulates really all that we've done as service members. And when I, what I mean by that is I see my colleagues who are 
taking that extra time to connect with residents in nursing homes, whether it's playing cribbage, watching the prices right, um, maybe taking a moment and holding the hand of somebody at a facility, a resident who's actively dying from a COVID infection. Um, one of my colleagues who took some time and sat down with a charge nurse at a substation who had tears in her eyes because yet another staff member had called in and she had nobody to staff her facility for the next shift. And, and hearing that conversation saying, we're gonna be here for you and we'll be back tomorrow and we'll be back the day after that and we're gonna continue to come back until your facility is back on its feet. Wow, that is fantastic. That is really great that you're doing that. That's sort of the, when I think of the support, that's really, that's what I think of and how that innate, innate ability of us as Minnesotans to really rally and bond together and come together in this pandemic. Um, to me, that's, that resonates more than the support that we traditionally think of of helping to pass medications or give a resident a bath or clean a resident's room. You know, and I, I, I have to think too that that is playing a role in the numbers of cases at the long-term facilities going down, the number of deaths going down. I just feel like all of that is helping in that effort. So thank you, actually yes. saving lives in that. And then what about vaccines? Um, what is the role with the Minnesota um, National Guard as far, as far as vaccines? What are you doing? Really largely we're supportive. Uh, we support the state, we support the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, we've been doing this since early January. And so we're actively out there engaged, um, whether it's administrative tasks or helping to park and, and, and facilitate, you know, other sort of um, needs that the, that the state has. Uh, last weekend, for example, we were transporting vaccine to all four corners of the state because there was nobody to get things from the airport to local communities that really needed the vaccine. Wow. Um, and, and if need be, you know, we've got a lot of people who are trained to do vaccinations and we can put shots in arms if, if asked. Well, uh, we want to thank you for all that you guys are doing and thank you for your service as well. So that's really important. So thank you so much. And again, for your time for being here, what an honor to have you with us, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Wolf. So thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Up next, we talk with the local cardiologist on how we, what we have learned since last March about heart disease and COVID-19. And here is Dr. Andrea Elliott. Joining us now, we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Andrea Elliott, a cardiologist with M Health Fairview and the University of Minnesota Medical School. So glad to have you with us, Doctor. Thank you for taking time to be with us. Thank you for the invitation. You know, it's been a year now since we've been exposed to COVID-19. What have we learned about COVID-19 and the heart? It's been a learning process throughout this whole past year. Absolutely, I agree. Um, certainly over the last year, uh, our understanding of COVID and how it affects all the organs has evolved um, substantially. And our understanding on how to protect ourselves has, has changed quite a bit too. Um, so as you well know, I think we were talking earlier about um, some of your, your husband's exposure and your own personal experiences with COVID. Um, one of the things that we were uh, most concerned about um, early on was how COVID would directly affect the heart. We all knew that it would affect the lungs, but what would happen to the heart? Um, one of the early concerns was that the, the virus could directly impact how well the heart functions. Um, over time, we have found that, that, um, that it's more of an indirect impact as the majority of COVID patients um, will have, those that are symptomatic and end up in the hospital will have some evidence of injury to the heart tissue, but there's varying degrees of how severe that is. Sometimes it's just a leaking of the enzymes of the heart um, and there's no actual symptoms that the patients get from that, um, that injury to the heart. Other times it goes on to progress um, to more severe injury, but that's actually relatively rare. Well, that's good to know, to hear that. You know, so what, how does the COVID-19, how does that cause heart damage? What are some of the things that it does? Yeah, so that's something that we're working to understand. Um, so there's, it's probably what we call multifactorial, meaning there's multiple reasons that it's hurting the heart or damaging the heart. Um, we really don't understand it just yet. And so we're working to collect information about that. 
Most of us think that when people are severely ill, um, whether it be from a lung infection such as COVID-19 or otherwise, the heart has to work extra overtime. And that extra work the heart uh, does oftentimes leads to this leaking of the enzyme. Um, so it's not a surprise that it happens in some patients. What I think you're asking about is that, is there any direct impact of the heart tissue um, from the COVID, uh, COVID-19 virus? And um, there's some suspicion and that the virus causes what we call a myocarditis or an inflammation of the heart tissue. Um, and again, that is a relatively rare and uncommon finding, but it can be very severe if it does happen. Um, and so that's something that we're sort of collecting data on and it's ongoing studies right now to understand how that happens. I know early on too, we were concerned about people with pre-existing heart conditions, but I even heard from a, a colleague who said that um, she was doing well, she has coronavirus, but now she has, um, I think she said rapid heart rate, I think is what she had said that she had no pre-existing heart conditions that she was aware of, but now she has this lingering condition. And I think she was diagnosed last month or so. So it's still fairly new since she was diagnosed. Right. Right. Absolutely. I think one of the main, um, so one, that's an excellent point that I think I'd like to, to emphasize is that uh, pre-existing heart conditions we know increases the severity of illness of COVID-19. So those that have underlying heart problems, if they develop COVID, it makes that their COVID uh, illness course much more severe. Now, some patients um, do go on that don't, rather, that don't have heart conditions prior um, and then get COVID do seem to have some residual effects on their heart. It's relatively uncommon because again, this is primarily, it seems to be a lung, a lung disease that, that then puts extra stress on the heart. Um, so what we usually encourage patients to do is give them themselves their lungs time to recover. Um, there's often this residual long-term uh, long fatigue uh, and the body, as the body recovers from the, the severe infection. And then as that recovery process happens, we'd anticipate the symptoms should lessen over time. If they don't lessen over time, uh, usually patients are seeing their primary care physician or other, other physicians that they have in their care network. And then we'll get referred to a cardiologist for any additional testing if that's still appropriate. I know as we had, I had mentioned my husband when he was diagnosed with coronavirus, I was concerned about his lungs like you know, as concern, but, you know, we had got one of the heart, not the um, oxygen level, as well as yeah. his blood pressure. So I was always sure that those numbers all stayed normal or whatever, so that we weren't concerned. But um, so but he did have that lingering fatigue for a while. And then I was yeah. concerned about that, is, you know, right. there's something I should be worried about. And, you know, he was in contact with his primary care physician and stuff like that. But so if someone has had coronavirus, if, um, when should they go see a specialist like yourself, a cardiologist? I mean, are, what symptoms and things should they be concerned about that they should further um, seek some medical care? Right. Yeah. Excellent question. So uh, first, I'd encourage you that it's, very, it's not uncommon that patients take a very long time to recover from this virus. Um, and we do see that it's a prolonged process. Um, I think the first clue would be that this should be an upward trajectory. So after the first couple of weeks, once the virus, you know, the, the acute illness has passed, we'd anticipate that people continue to have improvement over time, though it may take longer than anyone would hope or expect. Um, if, however, someone has any symptom of, you know, chest pain that, didn't, that doesn't go away, um, shortness of breath that is worsening, um, chest pain or shortness of breath with exertion or, or activity that doesn't go away, swelling of the legs or hands that does that progresses or doesn't go away. Those kind of things would be symptoms that I personally would be concerned about. And I'll always work with a primary care doctor to help decide, is this something that would be expected or is this something that's new and needs to be investigated and, and seek out medical, medical help or advice from a specialist. And there are treatments available for all the various conditions that they may develop as well. So. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Any um, other advice for someone um, concerned about COVID-19 and their heart and things like that that you would give for them? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the, the first and foremost is um, following all the guidelines that are put out by the CDC, which is um, wearing our mask, 
social distancing, staying home when you can, um, and still being safe, even though the, the vaccine is out there, um, it's still part of the recommendations until uh, the vaccine is broadly available. Um, and so I think that's still crucial and people are doing such a great job right now. Um, I think that uh, that's gonna continue to be an important part of the, the picture as we move forward. In addition, um, getting the vaccine when it's available um, and that's increasingly again gonna be available for uh, more and more populations. So working with your primary care doctor to understand when um, you might be able, able to receive that vaccine. I'm encouraged when people are posting like, hey, I got my vaccine or I got my second dose and stuff. So that's good to see that that's public accepting the vaccine and, and more and more people getting it, yeah. Yes, I, I've had my vaccine too. <laughs> Well, I haven't been able to get signed up yet, so, but I'm looking forward to getting the vaccine as soon as it's available for me, though. I well, hope you Dr. can. Dr. Elliot, a pleasure to have you with us and um, great advice for our viewers. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, too. I got to Moxie after I hurt my neck. First, I took them to feel better. Then, I just kept taking them. I didn't know they'd be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. Joining us now is Dr. Christy Trussell with the Urgency Room to answer your latest questions about rapid COVID testing and why get tested now. Hello, Dr. Christy Trussell with the Urgency Room. Glad to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, I understand that um, your, um, the Urgency Room is providing COVID tests available daily at all of your urgency rooms. Um, what Can you tell us a little bit about the testing that you're currently offering and a little bit more about it? Yes, we're doing quite a bit of COVID testing at the urgency rooms. Um, we're offering a rapid molecular test. So it's a DNA test that um, looks for the, the COVID virus DNA. Uh, it's uh, you know, there's a couple of different tests out there, and this is considered to be one of the more accurate ones that has uh, good sensitivity to find to find infection. It's looking for that viral DNA. I, I, that was going to be one of our questions. How accurate is it? So this is one of those that you said is really more accurate than the accuracy is really high, actually. Correct. Yes. So um, when you offer that, you virtual you virtual, you offer it as virtual on demand and also um, schedule appointments. Tell us how does that work? Then. Right. So through, through our website, we're offering a relatively new service where you can, uh, you can log in and talk to one of our physician assistants or nurse practitioners um, and it is an on demand service and go through your symptoms using your virtual visit. And then uh, if you and the provider agree that a COVID test is necessary, then you would just head to the urgency room and do uh, a quick self-collect sample. It's a quick in and out process where um, you don't wait on site for the results. And then we follow up with you via that virtual platform. So very right. quick and efficient way to get a, a COVID test. Yeah, I can see how that would be um, desirable that people can get in there when they want to be able to, um, if they think that they need it. You know, and somebody says, why do they still need to be tested? That's really important. Why is that? Well, certainly, you know, COVID is still spreading in our community. Uh, fortunately, at this point, our COVID infection rates are falling relative to what we had seen you know, earlier in the winter. Uh, we, the, we are still recommending for anyone with symptoms, uh, COVID symptoms get tested. Um, as we have more and more kids and people returning to school and the regular activities, we are seeing uh, requests for testing for exposure. The, um, so even if, you're, even if you're asymptomatic and you had a close exposure to someone with COVID, we, uh, the CDC does recommend uh, COVID testing between day five and seven, just to catch those uh, folks who either have early or asymptomatic infections, and that's really a good public health tool to prevent spread of the virus. And along those same lines, then if someone does test positive, then they should not return to work or work. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, 
Yep. So certainly a positive COVID test would change recommendations for quarantine and isolation. Um, after a positive test, we do recommend isolating for 10 days after the positive test, or if you do, if, if you had developed symptoms 10 days after the onset of symptoms. Um, if you have a negative test that really doesn't fully rule out your rule out being infected, um, certainly you can go on to develop symptoms later in the course. The uh, so, you know, the full CDC quarantine is still recommended at 14 days. There are some exceptions to that um, with a negative test at days five through seven. But even in those cases, really monitoring your symptoms, maintaining masking and social distancing, if you are uh, able to do the shorter quarantine. Well, that's okay. And trying to stop the spread. So good advice there. Um, so those that are, may not be familiar with the urgency room, very quickly, can you tell us a little bit about the urgency room. Yeah, so we, uh, the urgency room is a freestanding medical facility that's designed to practice kind of the full spectrum of acute care medicine. So we see everything from asymptomatic COVID testing and minor complaints all the way up to more serious complaints like chest pain, heart attacks, uh, and more serious abdominal complaints. We're able to do uh, full evaluation for most of those complaints with uh, we have full laboratory and the ability to do CT, ultrasound. So um, we're staffed by emergency physicians and then specially trained emergency providers. So they can come in and see you if they have any of those issues and things. Absolutely. So find the advice that you might have for viewers on the vaccine, about getting the vaccine. So the, the vaccine is becoming more and more available. And I would certainly recommend that when it's your turn to get vaccinated, it's okay. been found to be, to be very safe. Um, and we haven't seen, we haven't seen people having problems after they've gotten it and lots of people have gotten it now. So that's going to be the key to key to uh, solving our COVID problems. Well, great advice as always. So thank you, doctor. Thank you. For having with us. Joining us now is Dr. Renee Penikoff on what impact COVID-19 and social isolation is having on our kids and what help is available. Here is Dr. Penikoff. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in Woodbury and I have a private practice, full-time private practice. So I, and the majority of my clients are kids and um, mostly middle school kids and high school kids. And so I have direct experience really um, counseling those young people and hearing about their struggles. And I'm also the mom of two teenagers, well, actually 21 and 17. Um, but I think the, the social isolation is really difficult. It, it impacts kids by affecting their social and emotional learning, right? They're not able to connect with others. Um, it's a critical stage of development, especially for teenagers in high school who are sort of forming their tribe, so to speak. And so to not have, or to have a big gap in connecting with young, their, their peers is really difficult for them. So there's a lot of grief and loss that they go through. Um, there's also a huge impact on the disruption of their routine, right? having their routine of getting up in the morning, going to bed at hopefully a good hour at night, and then um, um, being able to have some place to go in the morning, sort of almost like have a purpose. And so um, online learning, the consequence of online learning um, and some hybrid models has really affected and disrupted kids' schedules, which can be really dysregulating. And um, Another sort of added consequence of all of that is kids are, are on their phones more, right? They're doing a lot more social, um, social, socializing through their phones and their computers, and then mostly young men, but young women too, and kids, young boys and girls too, are, are really turning to video games, right? So they're mm -hmm. not getting social interaction and the social media, the video games just aren't what they're, they're not hugging. They're not looking they're at each other. They're not seeing each other smile. And um, this is contributing to a lot of depression, feeling disconnected. I think for parents and caretakers, I love the two words connect and redirect. 
It's simple. Um, it's simple in, the, in sort of theory, but it's not always as simple to practice. But connect means to really meet our kids where they're at. It doesn't matter what age they are. They could be littles, kindergarten and first grade, all the way up to college age kids and just meet them where they're at, ask them how they're doing, um, listen to them when they share what they're struggling with. And that's the connection part, right? Really believing them and hearing them and listen not to respond, but to understand, okay? And then once we feel like we have that connection, if we do get the connection, then to redirect. So connect and then redirect them to, okay, so you're really struggling right now. This is really hard. Can you and I come together, your dad and I, your mom and I, your, your um, grandma and I come together and come up with some ways to redirect you, whether it be let's structure your day, let's get you moving, let's get your bodies moving, let's, let's start eating a little bit healthier, right? Let's figure out a way you can connect with your friends because you're feeling so lonely. Um, and, and in doing this connect and redirect, we're really doing what kids are missing um, due to COVID being in such isolation, right? We as the caretakers and the parents can role model for them what they need to do and then help them problem solve how to get there. Now, again, I don't mean to, um, to say that this is easy, right, to do with our kids, but really listening at first and then problem solving collaboratively with them. And, you know, um, we all know moving our bodies, eating healthy, but we need a participating young person, right? And if we connect with them first, we're gonna have more success in redirecting them to some healthier habits. I think it's so important as adults to take care of ourselves, right? To make sure that we are um, getting enough sleep, making sure our own mental health um, needs are taken care of, to make sure that we're moving our own bodies and managing our own stress so that we can be there for our young people, so that we can be there for our children, our grandchildren, our teenagers, um, so that we can do that critical piece of, um, that I mentioned earlier, that connecting with them and really listening to them, hearing them, meeting them where they're at, even if they're grumpy and crabby, and I like to use the word prickly with us, um, to just sit with them and, and connect with them and believe them that they're struggling so that we can redirect them to what they need. But if we as adults um, are struggling ourselves, that's harder to do. So don't forget to take care of yourself right? And to make sure that you are getting your own needs met and reaching out for support as an adult, if you need that as well. And that's going to be the best for all of our kids. That is our program for you. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone.